infection. And I hadn't really seen that. I think he and Dr. Kennedy and a couple of other uh, newer anesthesiologists are using some uh, different techniques in the operating room. Um, in some ways, uh, part of our ERAS you know, protocols to reduce post-operative narcotic use, and methadone appears to be uh, a really good method for doing that. So he's going to talk to us a little bit more about that, and I uh, really appreciate him uh, agreeing to talk to us. Thank you, Brent, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, as he said, I'm Jim Richardson. I'm actually new to Erlanger. I uh, joined ACE, the anesthesia group here, uh, in September. So I've worked with some, not all of you, and appreciate your uh, graciousness and uh, welcoming me uh, in the op operating room and at least pointing me in the right direction when I was lost in the hallway. But uh, as Brent said, we were in the operating room, uh, and I was using some methadone on a patient, and um, we got, got into the conversation. He asked me to speak on it, and I... Uh, willingly jumped at uh, the bait. I don't know if he had a spot he really needed to fill. I understand uh, what a chief resident's duties are, uh, and that's okay. Uh, I wanted the opportunity to speak with you all as well, um, not to convince you of anything, not to sell you of anything on anything, and maybe convince, but uh, I'm not here to tell you that the way you've done things or the way things are done is wrong, bad, uh, inferior. Uh, necessarily, uh, and that this is the only way. Uh, I guess I would offer it as an opportunity to share some things that have been going on in the background that even within the world of uh, anesthesiology, most uh, anesthesiologists uh, have not been introduced to, and uh, if we're going to be doing it, it would be helpful that we do it together. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to talk about perioperative methadone. A uh, professor of mine at Emory, uh, Dr. Carl Hugg, uh, who was kind of a, a giant in some of the uh, early research on narcotics, uh, he has a uh, doctorate in pharmacology prior to going into anesthesiology, uh, all the way back in 1980 was asking uh, the question, uh, how can we do this better? How can we serve patients better regarding perioperative pain? Um, 30 years later, the question was still being asked. Uh, an editorial by uh, Karish and Anesthesia and Analgesia still noted that more than 40% of the post-op patients were reporting inadequate pain relief. And there are some reasons for why that may be so. Some of it is the novelty of faster uh, and uh, more potent drugs uh, that have been developed in those 30 years. Uh, and with the moves uh, towards outpatient surgery, moving patients out of the hospital sooner, obviously there was a drive for quicker, faster. But maybe the patients got lost somewhere in there as it regards uh, how their experience was as we were giving uh, ever more short-acting drugs, trying to move them out. So I'm going to present to you on methadone today. It's not new. <laughs> so it was developed by the Germans in 37. Um, it was introduced in the U.S. as a spoil of war. Uh, the uh, National uh, in Commercial Intelligence Agency basically sold it off uh, the rights to use it to any company that was willing to pay a dollar for it. Uh, Eli Lilly introduced it in 47. It was originally developed for analgesia. Uh, it's best known in the U.S. Uh, for uh, helping those who are addicted to opioids. Uh, it is not structurally similar, similar to morphine. Uh, which is sort of the base for all comparisons, it seems, uh, in the narcotic world. Uh, its site of action is somewhat unique because it has both mu opioid in one of its stereoisomers <clears throat> and NMDA antagonist activity in both of the stereoisomers. And the uniqueness of its capabilities to help us, we think, may be related more to the NMDA than the mu. Its metabolism, it's very highly soluble in fat, uh, has therefore a large volume and distribution. <clears throat> However, its elimination half-life is exceedingly uh, long uh, as compared to other narcotics, uh, and there's a, a lot of variability, uh, and that is due to <clears throat> the different polymorphic uh, expressions of the cytochrome uh, P450 uh, that metabolizes it. Uh, the CYP2B6, uh, has only within the last 10 years been identified as the cytochrome. Uh, and in fact, there's a, still an FDA black label warning on the incorrect uh, cytochrome uh, that, that hasn't been removed. 
Um, so therefore, there is significant variability of the clearance and also the minimum effective concentration. So uh, as recently as three years ago, uh, Karish, the same uh, author who uh, penned the editorial in 2011 saying, why are we still not doing better, did a study uh, that essentially looked at the different polymorphic uh, expressions of the uh, cytochrome <clears throat> and noted that uh, in the uh, C, uh, C 6.6 carriers, there was diminished metabolism and clearance, therefore more pronounced um, uh, response to the drug, and there was a uh, increased metabolism for the 6.4s. Uh, what does that mean to us? Well, clinically, it means that uh, due to uh, genetics and um, how they've been distributed over time, uh, different populations around the world uh, have different um, expressions uh, that are more likely to occur. So uh, specifically in African Americans, because there's a large proportion of 6.6 .6 and an absence of 6.4, need to be a little bit more cautious with how much uh, we give. One of the other reasons that methadone's probably been in the shadows, and although it's very old uh, and maybe fits the bill uh, for uh, perioperative pain control, there's a lot of misperceptions about it, and people uh, sort of shy away from it because of the stigma of opioid addiction. Uh, the onset of methadone is perceived as being slow onset, and I think that's probably just because everyone understands that it lasts a while, and so they just sort of piggyback on that it must come on slowly. There's also a misperception that the duration of methadone is shorter than its elim half elimination half-life, and that can be true, just like most drugs. It just depends on what kind of clearance you're talking about. Is this redistribution kinetics? Again, it's got a very large volume of distribution, or is this elimination kinetics uh, that we're talking about? Um, so. Karish also uh, did a study uh, in 2011, uh, published in Anesthesia and Analgesia, and what you have here uh, are graphs that show four different narcotics uh, and the blood levels uh, that are denoted by the red triangles. The blue triangles are basically uh, showing uh, a marker efficacy, uh, so clinical presentation of the response to the drug, uh, specifically here meiosis. So in the upper left-hand corner, you've got alfentanil, and you can see that the plasma level and the clinical expression or the efficacy of it match pretty tightly, similar to fentanyl uh, in the right upper uh, corner here. And methadone in the bottom left here also follows fairly tightly the plasma concentrations and the effect. Uh, in contrast to morphine, uh, which the plasma levels come up early and then you see the effect later, which all of you I'm sure are very familiar with. Um, so methadone would, would fit more uh, in line with some of the shorter acting uh, narcotics we're familiar with. And again, this is represented here in this table. Uh, they are listed in order of the elimination half time. So remifentanil, as everyone's probably familiar with, is a very short elimination half time, uh, all the way down to methadone, which is 24 to 36 hours and even longer in some patients. Um, however, if you look at the efficacy, uh, the half time to the effector site, it looks a whole lot more like fentanyl, okay? Even though the conversation usually with methadone is, is it's compared more to morphine, uh, which if somebody's in pain and you give them a dose and you're not really getting to the effector site for another couple hours, I'm not sure we're serving them well. So the duration of analgesia is not shorter than the elimination half-life, as I've just shown. In small doses, again, the effect is terminated by redistribution. It's how propofol works, right? The reason that it comes off so quickly, and fentanyl as well, is that it just gets redistributed very quickly because its volume of distribution is so large. And in large doses, if I go above the minimum um, concentration uh, for efficacy, then it will go to systemic elimination, as, as we showed, 24 to 36 hours uh, is a significant period. So to look at that in, in more, more of a pictorial uh, version, they took, uh, Karish took some data from some studies done that I'll go over in uh, just a minute uh, by a physician named Gourley. Um, who did a series of studies essentially showing that the plasma concentrations of methadone match up with uh, the efficacy. Um, and so 
this depicts the time after initial dose on the x-axis. On the y-axis, it shows the blood methadone concentrations. And this box in the inset here is just the first hour that's scrunched up really tight right here. So initially, uh, and we've got doses of, it's all line of five milligrams of methadone, then 10, 20, and 30, uh, and those line up five, 10, 20, and 30. So initially, all of them go up into this range here, and this green line, or this green box, if you will, represents the uh, point at which the blood concentration of methadone achieves efficacy of analgesia. So above that line, the patient uh, doesn't experience the pain. Up until you hit this line where it starts to turn red, where we get sort of the side effect or the toxic effect of respiratory depression. Obviously, our goal is to live between these two lines. So initially, with these doses, almost all of them uh, will push the patient up towards apnea. But very quickly, uh, they all come down because of redistribution. And then because of the long elimination, you get this long plateau, which looks much steeper here. But bear in mind, we're talking hours here on the x-axis. So we're, here's a day. Here's two days. Typically, we're giving doses uh, in the 20 to 30 milligram range as a bolus. And so we start here, and even at 24 hours, we've still got no pain for most patients on average, okay? And if we give 30, we're pushing it all the way out to a day and a half. So in Dr. Hugg's editorial back in 1980, uh, being the extremely bright uh, gentleman that he is, hypothesized what would be the ideal uh, drug, if you will, uh, or scenario uh, for taking care of perioperative pain in an appropriate manner. And you can read, but I will uh, read out the highlighted portion here, a fairly constant drug level within the therapeutic range while avoiding levels that may be toxic, which I think are uh, pretty uh, apt words to describe what we just looked at on, on, on that uh, diagram. and that the therapeutic and toxic levels must be defined and that the factors contributing to the variability must be identified. So I've already alluded to uh, this study uh, back in tw uh, 2015 by Karish that dealt with factors contributing to the variability uh, with regards to the uh, cytochrome P450. Uh, but what about the therapeutic and toxic levels? Uh, have they been defined and, and, and how did that happen? So I said that Gourley uh, did some studies um, in the 80s. It was a series of fairly straightforward, uh, simple but elegant studies uh, to tackle this problem. Uh, and Karish wrote an editorial in 2011 that sort of summarized them. Uh, and, and I can say in summary that the therapeutic and toxic levels are now uh, fairly well defined. The first study that Gourley did was in 1982. Uh, there were 23 general surgical uh, and orthopedic patients uh, that all received 20 milligrams of IV methadone after induction. He then grouped them into three categories uh, based on uh, their post-operative course. So almost 40% of them uh, were pain-free. They had no post-op analgesia needs. Uh, so they, they got asked for and got nothing else. A quarter of the patients uh, used non-narcotic analgesia, Tylenol, ibuprofen, excuse me, ibuprofen. Um, and the first time that they asked for that was 26 and a half hours on average after uh, they got their dose of methadone. And 35% uh, received some narcotic analgesia, which was about 18 hours uh, after that first do dose of methadone. And you could hypothesize that this is an expression of the patient variability uh, of how they metabolize the drug. Conclusions from the study were that prolonged analgesia uh, in methadone is similar to its terminal half-life and that there is a relationship between the blood methadone concentration and analgesic response. He determined this by drawing blood samples and, and uh, basically recording what the blood levels were for each of the patients uh, when they asked for the pain medication. Obviously, the patients who didn't ask for any didn't um, have as many data points, but essentially showed that there was a threshold for each patient in their plasma at which uh, they consistently uh, felt pain. 
And of note, and very important to you all, I'm sure, is this topic, uh, you mull it over, yeah, but what about the concerns over the, the long-term uh, exposure to the toxic or uh, undesired side effects, namely respiratory depression? There were no episodes of respiratory depression as defined by ten, less than 10 breaths per minute, and there was no increase in the nausea and vomiting compared to a uh, conventional narcotic regimen at the time. So two years later, uh, Gorley asked another question, can this be titrated so that the different windows or categories of, of patients described in the previous study could also uh, be cared for? Uh, can we safely give other doses after the initial? So we took 16 general surgery patients uh, who have an upper abdominal surgery and, uh, and or spinal fusion uh, and gave them again 20 milligrams of IV methadone after induction and then uh, developed a regimen for post-op titration. The criteria for the titration of the methadone afterwards uh, was doses of either two and a half, five, or 10 milligrams um, based on the patient's pain score. And these criteria had to be met before any dose was given. So first, they had to have a spontaneous report of pain. You don't ask the patient, which I know flies in the face of the fifth vital sign or the sixth vital sign, whatever. Um, but, but the patient had to initiate that they hurt. They also had to have an unstimulated respiratory rate of greater than 10 breaths per minute, uh, no significant clinical depression of uh, level of consciousness, and it had to be 45 minutes since the previous dose. So at the conclusion of the study, the results showed that uh, the patients needed a median of two 5 milligram doses in PACU to achieve uh, their efficacy concentration and then an additional, on average, one five milligram dose on the floor to achieve prolonged analgesia. The, uh, and once they achieved their efficacy in PACU, it was 21 hours before they, uh, on average, needed another dose of anything. And if they did get a top up on the floor, uh, they had an additional uh, seven, uh, seven and a half to eight hours uh, before they uh, needed anything else. Um, the minimum effective concentration was measured prior to all the dosings. And again, it showed and reinforced that there was a relationship between the blood concentrations and the response within each individual. So still at it, two years later in 86, uh, he did a double-blind comparison of 20 patients. Again, small study. Uh, compared morphine directly to methadone um, in upper abdominal surgery. Patients received 20 milligrams of either methadone or morphine, again, blinded uh, intraoperatively, and then five milligram doses similar to the uh, protocol described uh, two years prior in the 84 study. So it turns out that to get patients to their uh, minimum uh, efficacious concentration, the, there was no difference in the initial doses statistically between the morphine and the methadone. However, after they got there, the time to uh, the first dose of any other uh, narcotic was drastically different, 21 hours for methadone and six hours, as you can see. And the average cumulative dose was far less with methadone, 12 milligrams versus 41. And the average number of doses was also lower uh, with methadone at two and morphine with eight. And this fits with the profile, kinetic profile of the drugs. So 30 years later, <laughs> So uh, it, it seems that, th that those studies happened and, and, and nothing came of it, really. Again, probably because novel drugs were coming out and medicine was moving, as I said earlier, to faster, quicker. Uh, Gottschalk uh, published a paper in uh, January of uh, 2011 looking at complex spine surgery. Uh, 30 adult patients, uh, you can see their ages, un undergoing multi-level spine surgery, uh, considered uh, Studies will show that, that uh, complex spine surgery uh, from the posterior approach uh, ranks probably second uh, as far as patients' perception of pain afterwards. Uh, they received either an initial loading dose of uh, sufitinil uh, and then was, uh, they were started on a sufitinil infusion, which is a uh, typical, usual uh, approach for uh, back surgery uh, from our perspective. And then we compared that to a methadone dose of 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, which again is sort of in the mid-teens to, to about 20 milligrams range. Um, 
and postoperatively, uh, all the patients were given a PCA pump. And if you look at this uh, graph, the um, sufitinyl groups in black, methadone group uh, is in red. Uh, these are uh, their visual uh, pain acuity scores uh, at 24, 48, and 72 hours. And at each point, you can see that the sufitinyl in black is significantly, um, well, it's significantly higher at 48 hours. Um, and um, from the data it would suggest and some further studies uh, afterwards that uh, 72 hours uh, there's um, a suggestion that as you move forward in time actually the the benefit improves as compared to early on bear in mind that that the trending was towards um, less pain and yet this is despite uh, less drug uh, from the methadone standpoint. So if you look at, again, 48 and 72 hours there, there's a significant difference in the uh, amount of uh, equivalent, again, morphine equivalents uh, in the sufitinyl in black and the methadone group in red, uh, particularly here and here. Again, in the first 24 hours, not really a significant difference, although a trend towards it. Uh, the, the thought behind this is that, again, the NMDA component of methadone um, blocks or affects the tendency towards hyperalgesia uh, from early narcotic and uh, high doses of narcotics, and that you see that effect later where the patient doesn't develop the uh, pain memory, uh, and so that the effect actually uh, carries out uh, towards uh, three days. And again, uh, with concern for side effects, uh, these are reported side effects uh, for both the sufentanil and the methadone group. Um, and if you look uh, over on the left, you've got hypotension, uh, respiratory depression, uh, hypoxemia, arrhythmia, nausea, vomiting. Uh, none of them were, were significantly different between the two groups, in essence, to say it's safe. So just three years ago, um, again, published uh, in anesthesiology, uh, they sort of one-upped and said, all right, well, we're going to blind this because the last study really wasn't blinded. Um, and, and see, you know, how does this work in cardiac surgical patients? Um, and so they took 156 patients uh, who went under uh, cardiac uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, randomized them to receive either methadone uh, or fentanyl uh, interoperatively, uh, and postoperatively uh, they recorded their uh, pain requirements and then assessed for pain uh, during rest and activity. And then they were also evaluated for side effects uh, again. So the results show that the morphine requirements during the first 24 hours uh, were reduced uh, from a median of 10 milligrams uh, in the fentanyl group to 6 milligrams in the methadone group. Uh, and this is, um, again, the post-op operative uh, pain requirements. The level of pain with coughing uh, was reduced. Uh, at 12 hours from uh, six hours, uh, from, from six to four rather, the pain score. And there was a improvement in the patient's perceived quality of pain uh, in the methadone group as compared uh, to the fentanyl. Uh, and as well, uh, the adverse events in this study showed and there's no difference, again, safe. This table shows um, the pain scores for the uh, patients in each group, and then it uh, compares them. So the third column is the difference. So a negative number would show, uh, if it's negative, would be uh, the methadone group having a lower uh, visual pain score. If it's positive, uh, it would mean that the methadone's greater. And you can see um, the level of pain at rest up here in the top. All the way down, uh, the methadone was less, and significantly so. Uh, level of pain with coughing, uh, all the way through again was negative. Uh, so the methadone uh, provided less pain with coughing, uh, all the way through 72 hours, uh, and again significant all the way down. And then overall satisfaction with the pain management. If you look, all of these are significantly higher meaning that the patients were much happier with the methadone and again significant uh, all the way across and again 72 hours to th three days uh, afterwards 
Regarding the side effects, uh, again, uh, there is no difference, and I would uh, highlight that the hypoventilation, which is probably the one of, of most of ours con uh, concern with methadone and narcotics in general, was almost one, so the same. So the same group two years later, uh, in essence, repeated the uh, spinal surgery, but it, again, blinded at this time. Took 120 patients, uh, and instead of comparing it to uh, fentanyl, which would have been common for cardiac surgery, used uh, dilaudid, uh, which is typically uh, something, again, we, we might use for uh, spine surgery. They gave uh, methadone uh, at the start of the surgery uh, in the patients who were randomized to methadone uh, and gave hydromorphone uh, or dilaudid uh, two milligrams at the end of surgery to the patients who randomized to the dilaudid group, all patients got something at the beginning and all patients got something at the end, just nobody knew which was which. Everything else was standardized. The primary outcome was uh, IV morphone, uh, uh, hydromorphone consumption on post-op day one. Uh, similar post, uh, pain scores and satisfaction were studied and side effects uh, also looked at. Uh, the median uh, hydromorphone use was reduced in the methadone group, not only on post-operative day uh, one, but also on post-op days two and three uh, with uh, significance. And the pain scores at rest and with movement and with coughing were also less uh, in the methadone group. Um, again, some very significant difference. So uh, all this correlates the satisfaction, uh, pain satisfaction scores were also similar to the previous study. Again, here's a table that uh, describes that. It's very similar to the one we just looked at uh, in the previous study. Uh, if you look at the methadone group, and compare it to the hyd uh, hydromorphone and dilaudid group, the amount of uh, dilaudid at the different stages um, showed that in each case uh, there was less uh, requirement for dilaudid and significantly so. Uh, and then f following, uh, if a patient uh, converted over to oral uh, pain medication at the discretion of their uh, surgical team, uh, again, they were still requiring less. Uh, and significantly so, although, again, there's a trend towards, if you look here in the first 24 hours, not as much significance, uh, and you start to see in the third day that it starts to uh, spread out. So it's a very future forward-looking concept uh, for the patient to stay in the hospital. And again, uh, their pain scores, uh, very similar, uh, again, to what we've been looking at. Level of pain at rest, pre-procedure for the spine surgery, the same. There's no difference in their pain, but as soon as they get into PACU and all the way down, you see significant uh, difference and an improvement in the methadone group as it regards uh, their perception of their pain. Level of pain with coughing, again, preoperatively the same, and it's starting in PACU all the way out to day three. Um, there's significant um, improvement starting in the evening on the third day, maybe not as much. Uh, level of pain with movement, again, the same. Pre-op, again, be a broken record here. Uh, satisfaction scores uh, all the way through the third day, again, uh, were better for the methadone group. So what are the conclusions that we can make from this series of studies uh, that stretch essentially over 30 years, uh, sort of have a, had a little heyday in the 80s, and then uh, within the last 10 years has been re-looked at? Uh, I think it's your specialty's drive with the ARIS protocols, uh, the desire to uh, expedite patients' care out of the hospital after surgery, but to do it well, which may have caused us to look at this um, again. And I think methadone represents an element uh, of what uh, could comprise uh, a different way of looking at uh, ARIS protocols and moving patients through uh, the hospital a little bit uh, more quickly, potentially, uh, and hopefully with better recovery. Uh, there's not really any good data to support it yet, but there's also a suggestion that because uh, norep norepinephrine and some other neurotransmitters in the brain are also uh, blocked uh, by uh, methadone, it may even uh, Im imbue uh, or enhance the patient's sense of well-being, much like an antidepressant, uh, or elevate their mood. Uh, as well as treat their pain. Um, so taking a look at our patients as, as human beings who uh, 
you know, experiencing this life and, and, and the things that they're going through, uh, just like we would if we were having surgery, and seeing them and, and thinking, how can I help them best? Um, again, I think methadone may offer uh, one way of, for us to do this. Um, and again, if you can give a drug once, you're decreasing uh, the incidence of uh, their exposure to the side effects and potential harms of uh, narcotic doses every time we get them and potentially push them up into an apnea threshold. So uh, that is the conclusion of uh, my presentation on methadone. I would certainly entertain any questions if I haven't gone wildly over time. And this is just for fun. So this is from <laughs> the 70s or 80s. Um, this is my favorite. So. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we, we're, we're beginning to hear as surgeons and, and you as anesthesiologists, I know about pathway to addiction and the fact that it takes almost nothing for us to uh, in, increase the chances of that happening with our patient. I'm sure uh, studies have also shown that this is either no worse or the same as other morphine equivalent uh, doses with methadone if you use it as analgesia. Do I, you understand what I'm saying? I, mean, I think your question is, is... My is, question is, I mean, we're, we're being told as surgeons to be very careful in the post-operative phase about how much, how we limit sure. our cocks. Now, I mean, I've not read that much about it. I've just kind of heard it around the edges, and I really don't have that problem in my practice right mm -hmm. now. Others with, uh, with a lot, with doing upper abdominal surgery and things like that, I, I don't, I mean, are, have we changed? Do we need to change? What do we need to change? And is methadone... Would it be any more of an advantage there than using morphine in a PCA pump? So I think the literature would suggest it if you took the literature from opioid dependence and sort of merged it with this, but that's not been directly studied. I mean, I think the question okay. is very uh, apt. I mean, I think the Attorney General uh, has suggested even that they mandate that the manufacturers of narcotics limit how much they make. You all are going to, anyone who's in a clinic and, and writing narcotics for somebody to go home is at risk yeah. of being okay. looked at or, or followed. I think I'm for asking the wrong question. I mean, it, it, this this really seems, you know, the data you show would make me think that we need to be changing pretty quickly here. Well, I, I, I think yes. I mean, the conclusion I would make from it is if I've got a significant portion of the patients in, stu in these studies who aren't even requiring oral narcotics in the yeah, hospital. That's what I mean. Uh, you know, I, why, why would I write a script so for them to go if, home? If, if methadone is the same as or less than morphine in terms of it being a pathway to addiction for a post-op patient as oh. a drug, then, then you know, and that's, sure. that's really my question. But Yes, no, I, th I, I think you could make really that conclusion. I guess that hasn't really been addressed as such. Then. Not directly. Yeah. yeah, but it shouldn't be any different, I wouldn't think. No. Question, yeah, Dr. Greer? Yeah, I'm just curious. I guess there's been no outpatient surgical studies done so far as if you could use a methadone for whatever hernias or gallbladders and not write them any opioids to go home on, it, would that be a possibility? I mean, look to me like maybe you could get by with nothing if you gave them methadone intraoperative. So there's some cautions, right? I mean, obesity, sleep apnea. Um, if the surgery is very short, you're going to have a very difficult time getting a patient up to their minimum effective concentration and have enough time to fall back into that window. So generally, if I'm not anticipating that it's going to be a, two, a good two-hour window, hour and a half to two hours that I have to get them up and down, probably not going to get the very sustained sort of 20 to 30 milligrams. But I can give you 10 milligrams and, 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 and get you in and out. Uh, there is no study to, to support that right now, and I would not jump at the idea of of pushing that right right now, but it would be interesting to, to, to take a look at, at doing that. And just one other thing, post-op, these studies were not using the more the uh, methadone post-op. Do people use that? You can use that orally and maybe diminish the other drugs that you're using? So you can, yeah. The onset for oral and IV are almost identical. So you, 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 you can get that same effect. Uh, the dosing, uh, the bioavailability is slightly different. So you would look at using twice the oral dose. So if, typically you'd be doing 5 milligrams of IV. You'd use 10 oral. Um, I, I would 
So there's some very specific criteria that, that, that obviously Gorley laid out in the 80s uh, when he did the studies about you must meet these criteria. And I think you would have to have a very robust uh, sort of uh, protocol in place uh, and a lot of uh, nursing education uh, that, that would be involved to do it safely. Uh, we got some pushback from the uh, cardiac ICU, for example, when we started using it. Uh, the, the nurses made a significant amount of noise. Uh, so we just pulled back out of it and said we're not doing this uh, because the surgeons were hearing it from the nurses and were concerned that it was delaying the extubations and their times and their ratings with the STS. And I understand that. That's valid and reasonable for them to be concerned about those things. It showed a, a lack of forethought on our part to, to do the, the education necessary to make it go well. But, but yes, you could do the, the dose as a methadone and, and avoid all the other narcotics. But, now, but, but your data would not reflect in any research that 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 is in fact the case, right? I mean, there's there's no objective evidence in the research that's been done that you would be have a prolonged time to extubation or anything like that. I there was no need for that. I went over and looked at the patients myself, but but these studies that were done also had education and the protocol in place. But if you take a nursing environment and this is the way we do things. And, and apply it over top of us sticking methadone in there. Yeah, you you know they're giving Narcan, and then turning right around and giving them morphine. Like, yeah. So so yeah. Again, it's a nursing education that was on our, uh, our, so, our so part. So back to Dr. Move. Greer's question though, the, the 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 window of time that you would expect you say an hour and a half to two hour case. I mean you would uh, uh, a case that takes an hour. You're not going to have an adequate uh, time of onset of effect. Um, it, it, you will. You, the peak if concentration. If you were doing an outpatient case, let's say. Um, if if I was doing an outpatient case, uh, if you look at the inset in this diagram right here, I'm gonna shoot myself with a laser here. So this is 30 minutes, and within 30 minutes, you're still in the window. So I mean, again, you could give five or ten. I mean, you could even give. 20 milligrams, but consistently to do that and, and to, to meet the burden of an outpatient center for getting people in and out, you'd probably want to err on the sort of 5 to 10 milligrams um, and then maybe supplement them um, with something. I, I, again, it really depends on how quickly the surgery is that, that you're trying to achieve, but you're not going to get the sort of 72 hours uh, benefit if you don't push them all the way up, uh, you know, with the 20, 20 and 30 milligrams. So okay, could, it, could it be done? Yes. You'd be cautious about sending somebody home. Again, okay, your, your criteria so, so for it would need not, to be fairly strict. We're not strict. at a point of thinking that this is something we could transpose to the outpatient setting at this point. I, I would not feel comfortable okay. doing that without looking uh, at it. Yeah, Dr. Stanley. Yeah, so th this, this is very intriguing, especially when we're talking about ERAS protocols. Um, one, a couple of things I'm, I'm wondering about. One is it, it, I wonder how robust the data is as far as postoperative ileus. I saw that it didn't seem there was much difference in nausea, uh, but with the mu, mu receptor, I, I'm a little concerned about that. The other one is um, it looks like that we're still a little early as far as the amount of data that we have on this. Is this do we have enough good data, or good studies that we we should start looking at at putting this in our ERAS protocol, or, or do we need to wait for more data? And the, also the um, the the I, I guess there's some analgesic effect or some um, uh, memory effect on this uh, amnesia effect. Is that do you think that's part of it also with the other re the receptor block the, the NM the other receptor blocker? You mentioned there's the a memory issue. Uh, no, I, there, there's really nothing to suggest that, that there's a, a, a memory issue from the drug and to okay. uh, address the ileus. Actually, they, they did look at those in the, in the studies. There, there was no difference. I just didn't uh, show that slide. And, and the ileus question, no difference, no difference in that. Wouldn't yeah. expect there would be, no. Not at yeah. all. Dr. Mackle? Yeah, um, very interesting. Uh, We've been using uh, methadone in the ICU for difficult sedation <coughs> ventilator wean patients and have been very happy with it. Uh, we're often, you mentioned nursing concerns, we're often, uh, it, it sort of has a stigmata about it as something used for drug addicts and you're putting this patient who's not a drug addict on a drug addict drug. And so we've dealt with that a little bit, but I think it can easily be overcome with uh, education. Mm -hmm. 
I just had the same uh, questions about in GI surgery, mm -hmm. what is the effect on post-op ileus? Because of the <clears throat> longer duration of effect, it would have some concerns to me about is this going to propagate an ileus or something like that. Yeah, and I, I can show you that data. They did look at that, and there was no difference. Yeah. We would, yeah, right. When you think it's time, some of us may be interested in I was going to say, it looks like some protocols, some uh, protocol. you know, from you about ways that we could safely start to look at this. Uh, sure. Because, I mean, I was naive enough to, when I saw he was going to talk about this, thought this was something that was going to help us with the opioid crisis. But uh, I, I really wasn't aware. I mean, I'd, I'd heard peripheral discussions in the past that methadone had been used in, for pain, but never any detail about it. I, I'm sure. more naive than the rest of you, I guess. But I didn't, I didn't know that. Brent? I had uh, one quick question about the cost. I don't know if you know, uh, is it an expensive drug? I think the oral stuff is pretty cheap, isn't it? But I don't know about the IV it's stuff. It's crazy cheap. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, that brings into a, a really good option. And I think in terms of uh, Dr. Burns' question about addiction, I think one of the pathways to addiction is pain. So if patients go home and they're in a lot of pain, then they get, you know, they are on that pathway of get, becoming addicted. So I think if you're eliminating or reducing the amount of post-operative pain, I think you're probably going to reduce the pathway to addiction. You don't have to send them home with 40 Percocets, and then their, you know, their grandkids don't get the Percocets and all this kind of stuff. So I think I think there's going to be some benefits uh, to that. And then uh, the second question or thought is, um, Chris and I were talking about here, it opens up a really good option for some uh, studies because we've had, I think, two years now of ERAS here at Erlanger. So you have two years of ERAS with no methadone, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then if you added methadone to the ERAS protocol, I mean, you have a pre and a post group right there that you could study. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, if somebody wanted to, to get onto that, I think it, it creates an opportunity for a really interesting study going from, and I don't know if anybody's done that, compared ERAS protocol specifically with and without methadone, but I think it creates a really uh, interesting research opportunity uh, going forward. So Yeah, I agree with the opportunity. We'd be willing to, to support and help. And uh, with regards to the reducing the, the exposure to the pain and uh, once the patient goes home, not only are you uh, directly impacting how much they're getting in the hospital, you're potentially blocking the pain memory from setting up in the first place, the hyperalgesia, which probably is what tends towards patients getting addicted uh, because the drugs just don't work as well for them if they get ramped up and we're trying to block that with the NMDA. It's, it's why the ketamine's on your ARIS protocol, actually. That's why, probably why it, it, it helps so much. Yes? Yeah. Are there any studies that look at uh, giving multiple small doses initially to, to get to an appropriate steady state without hitting that initial uh, apnea window? Um, uh, there are actually. There's a uh, well. This is an editorial. It's a comment from uh, a group that was uh, responding uh, to um, one of the articles that uh, it was um, actually one of Karish's, or actually one of Gorley's articles, basically saying that they did a titration of anywhere from eight to twelve milligrams initially, and then did uh, two milligrams at a time until uh, the, basically the patient reached their efficacy, uh, and. That was sort of their their paradigm. Uh, it was equivalent to, and it was about the same time as the Gorley study, where he was given two and a half, five or ten milligrams, and essentially erring on the lower side uh, and feeling good that I can give an additional dose safely within these criteria to get you there uh, and still have the benefit. So it it, it formally no, uh, other than the study in the 80s uh, that Gorley did, um, but but people have done it and have. have Expressed sort of their their paradigm for how they do it. Walter, so uh, my question I actually have uh, two of them. Um, one is, it seems like all these studies looked at uh, comparisons up to postoperative day three. Yes. Um, my concern is if you have someone who you discharge, say postoperative day two, and they're doing great in the hospital, and you discharge them, you know, without any home narcotics or anything, and day three comes along. What happens after that? Are they? Is it kind of like a spinal block where some of these patients have a sharp increase in their pain? You know, worry about sending them home and thinking they're doing great. And right. So again, when we were looking at uh, the significances and the, the differences, you also have to look at the absolutes, um, right? So the pain scores at that time, uh, and what were they? Um, so. 
if there, where are we? So here, here's your pain scores as they move down. Um, you know, patients are having a, a five here, um, five here, four here. Um, so they're still having some pain and probably getting some medication. Uh, again, I mean, they, a lot of these patients didn't go without, uh, but they were also not titrated up, right? So they got a fixed dose. In order to blind this, they got a fixed dose of 20. Uh, if you look at Gourley's studies in the 80s when he was doing the titrations, again, most of those patients, the median top-up dose uh, in recovery was another 10 milligrams, right? Two doses of 5 milligrams, and then almost 24 hours later, they got another 5 milligrams. So um, talking about trying to develop a, a, a protocol or a program where you felt comfortable with it enough that you did give those doses of methadone later, you might reach in a situation where you're not giving any other doses, you get the 40% of patients that Gourley found that needed nothing at all, right? And the other patients in the other three groups in his first study, because we've titrated them up and would hopefully go, come up into that group where they didn't need anything at all. In contrast to these later studies, because in order, again, to blind it, you, you're going to have to have that fixed dose, right? And so... Um, your concern's valid. I think it's 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 a, a solvable issue. You know, again, it hasn't been directly looked at. You're right. So, I mean, again, an opportunity for us to, to look at it. To that end, with the number of methadone clinics that there are, there must be a huge amount of data about uh, toxicity chronically with with methadone. I would think. I mean, there uh, definitely is, and so a lot of the literature that you look at is definitely with opioid uh, tolerance. There's a lot of warnings about it. Uh, you know, yeah. for respiratory depression, QT prolongation. Uh, you know, so that's something that I, I probably should have mentioned in, a, in there. It's in a different aspect of utilization, but nonetheless, I mean, the toxicity levels ought to be there, I would think. Um, so, so the difference is you're not necessarily comparing apples to apples when you right. give somebody an isolated that, event. But yeah. Still, yeah, okay. Yeah, Walter, go ahead. All right, and then the other thing was I was wondering if there's any studies or anything has looked at is this effect is still valid in people who are opioid naive versus chronic opioid users? Um, so the study in 2011 on uh, posterior spinal uh, patients um, essentially addressed that in that they did not discriminate or, or take patients out of the study if they were chronic uh, opioid users because they thought that was uh, planning to have a useless study, right? How can I apply this to anything that anybody's ever going to do if I take out the patients that they're going to see? Uh, and so the study in 2015, sorry, the 2015 study uh, in spinal fusion patients is uh, basically a representation of, of, of a mixed bag of patients who've been on uh, opioids um, and not. And so the difference between you the would, groups. You would assume that the chronic pain level in that patient group uh, would have been pretty significant too. Uh, yeah, if you dig into the the the, the pre the patient data, it actually there yeah. is a fairly significant portion right. of patients and, and who and had it chronic was pain. It was no different between the two groups. The so two groups were not different pre, in their mix, yeah. but but within those groups there was a mix. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mike. How about your How about your colleagues? How How are the other anesthesiologists feeling about this? Are they supportive? Uh, depends on who you ask. Uh, I think there's an unfamiliarity with it, and I said, you know, Dr. Burns is unfamiliar with it. Uh, no shame in that. Uh, our, in our specialty, there's a significant amount of, un of unawareness about it as well. Um, so I think it, it's, it's education. There's always hesitancy to change. Um, I'm sure I'll get there someday where I'm, I'm not interested in doing things new because the young guys are bothering me. Um, but but it's not hostile by any stretch. And I think if I think what they would want is to be educated about it um, and to have some protocol in place so that, that it was, they felt safe doing it, right? You mean no one wants to do something and expose themselves to, or a patient that they're taking care of to harm, so. Well, in my own case, with, with a lot of my cases, if we could do it safely, I mean, those patients could pretty easily go home with no narcotics for their grandchildren to get. I mean. I, I, I believe that to be true. Their pain is usually only in the first 72 hours for the most part, unless they have breast reconstruction. And I think the data and, and post-op surgical pain then, is they not. Don't, they don't require much, frankly, with what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. But if it increased patient satisfaction, it would be, it'd be you know, another step in, in improving health care. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Moore. 
Well, just one question. What about the other things like Suboxone that <clears throat> are out there? For We had a patient come in that was being treated for his narcotic addiction with Suboxone, and we, we simply gave him his normal dose as his um, post-operative pain medication, and then there's an IV form, and is that studied at all? I, I couldn't speak to it. I don't know. I didn't didn't look at, at that. And there's, there are some newer, longer acting um, narcotics that the, the, the pain world uh, has been writing. I'm sure have come across your you know your charts, and you're like, what in the world's that? I'm saying that sometimes. I'm like, what is that? I'm like, oh, that, I should probably know what that is. But uh, yeah, it, within the last ten years, a lot of a lot of new drugs have come out because again, there's a lot of pressure, government, uh, public uh, pressure. I mean, it's real. Uh, the, the pressure on us to to somehow govern this, you know, to yeah. to make sure that the the patient's uh, satisfaction quality scores are very high, and yet not give them narcotics. It's a good luck, right? Yeah. I had uh, one more question. Uh, the NMDA thing, notwithstanding, I seem to recall from pharmacology one of the things that lessened the addictive potential of methadone was a decreased sense of euphoria. It it treated uh, pain, uh, but it didn't uh, uh, cause the euphoria that you get with narcotics. Is, do you have any comment so, about that? So yes, there is. I mean, it, it, that's hard to quantify other than subjective uh, from patients. But yes, we know that it does not uh, tend towards a euphoric uh, high. Uh, it's one of the reasons that it has been a mainstay for decades in, in the you know, opioid addiction uh, world uh, for that very reason. So, uh, yeah, there's not a tendency for patients. No, can patients become addicted? Yes. Uh, an editorial in 1948, one year after it was released, uh, basically said, hey, there's this new drug, uh, but it looks like there may be a potential for, for abuse, but we're not sure or you, that addiction. Uh, turns out in the decades since, it, it's it's proven pretty solid, right? I mean, it's still the the main thing that we're using for opioid uh, withdrawal and or and, and addiction uh, treatment. So, you know, and I, I, some of you may or may not know, I, I've done critical care for a decade, and five of that I'm pretty much dedicated. And my experience is is the same as Dr. Maxwell's. The, it, it is also very helpful uh, in in that scenario as well. I mean take a patient off a fentanyl drip after seven days and they look like they're uh, spitting and fuming on the vent and you give them five or ten milligrams of uh, methadone elixir and it's like peace in the valley. So, yeah, it's it's a good drug. Other questions you come in? Well, this is uh, excellent talking, at least for me. Uh, very, very interesting. I think the suggestion that, that the potential for us to do some prospective studies here are really, really very good, and also the, some, some protocols for utilization would be good. At least it'd show we're trying to do something as physicians. I mean, some of the politicians are even opining, you know, that we physicians need to do more about opioid crisis, and we do, um, uh, and we surgeons and anesthesiologists especially do. So, uh, very well done. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Again, thank you for having me, and uh, I look forward to working working with you um, soon. I got to run. <clears throat>